Amen. You may be seated. Christy, thank you for reading our scripture this morning. Uh, Friends, it's great to get to be with you on uh, this 4th of July uh, weekend. Hopefully you're getting to do uh, some fun things. I do want to uh, make sure that you know there is a Lake Highlands 4th of July uh, parade every year, and it just so happens that Rex and Elaine Curtis, who are part of this congregation, they live right across the street uh, from where that parade begins. So uh, if you want to join us tomorrow morning between 8 and 9 a.m. at 10101 Royal Highlands Drive. We're going to have a bounce house for kids. We're going to have um, donuts and bagels and coffee. It's a great way to gather as a church, but it's also a great way for us to reach out uh, to our neighbors and be able to bless them, giving them coffee and donuts and um, getting to know them in that setting. So um, if you don't have plans for the 4th of July tomorrow, come join us uh, for that as a church. Um, Now, if you've been with us, Uh, The last couple of Sundays, uh, you know that we have been in this uh, summer teaching series in the Old Testament book of the Psalms. And the Psalms are this collection of prayers uh, that really help to facilitate a loving communion with the living God. Uh, The Psalms, they give us language to be able to express to God uh, whatever emotions we might be feeling, whatever circumstances we might be facing, and that's certainly true of Psalm 32 that Christy read for us. In many ways, Psalm 32 is a psalm all about what do we do with our guilt? How do we relate with God in those moments when we are feeling especially guilty? When we feel like we've messed up, we feel like we've blown it, But we feel like we've failed in some way, and and we're wondering, how do I get back to God? How do I return to God? How do I get back to that place of intimacy with him? When I feel like I've really messed up and blown it, how do I confess in the kind of way where actually I, I find that there's a greater joy? There's a greater freedom, maybe even a greater intimacy with God than I actually even had before. How do you confess in a way where you feel like you're really able to to move forward in an intimate relationship with God again? In fact, more than that, more than that, not just in those moments when we feel especially guilty, uh, but actually every day, how do we experience uh, what it is to know that that God loves us with an unfailing kind of love. Uh, Did you notice in verse 10, David says these words. He says, the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. You know, wouldn't it be amazing to be able to start every day feeling like you are surrounded by the unfailing love of God, even when you fail? How do you experience that? And You know, there's an illustration I think I've shared before uh, from an author named Dane Ortland. He wrote a book called Gentle and Lowly. And, you know, in that book, he uses this illustration. He says, imagine that it's a really cold day. I know that's really hard for us to imagine uh, right now in in the heat of Texas summer. But imagine it's a really cold day and you are just shivering inside your home. And then eventually the the thought dawns on you, wait a minute, I have a heater. I could be much warmer than I currently am. So you go to your heater and you, you crank it up. You turn it up all the way to 80 degrees. And yet, the vent in the room that you are in is still closed. You know, it doesn't matter then how much you might turn up the heat. It doesn't matter how much heat is going through those ducts. As long as that vent is closed, it's not going to warm you. You're still going to be shivering. And the point that Dane Ortland makes is he says, listen, a lot of us, we could intellectually affirm all day, God loves me. God forgives me. God accepts me, not based on anything that I have done, but rather based on what Jesus has done for me. He loves me based on his grace. But it's one thing to intellectually affirm that, and it's another thing to feel that to sense that reality in a way where it actually warms your heart. How do you open the vent? And you see, confession is the way that we do that. 
Confession is the way on a daily basis that we learn to, to open the vent, to actually experience the warmth of what it means to be surrounded by God's unfailing love even when we fail. And so what I want to do this morning is to look at this psalm. Do you know how to open the vent? Do you know how to pray in the way that David teaches us here in Psalm 32, this prayer of confession? And as we look at this psalm, I want us to notice um, really three headings. We'll look at it through three headings. Here they are. Um, first, the promise. What is the promise to those who learn this practice of confession? Secondly, the process. How do you go about confession in the kind of way where you actually experience that which is promised? And then thirdly, the power. Where do you find the power that would, would move you to even be willing to engage in this process of confession so that you can experience what's promised through it? So let's walk through those three together. So here's the first heading the promise. What is promised to those who confess? And right out of the gate, the psalmist tells us the promise, it's incredibly remarkable, the promise is that you will be blessed. That promise, it's repeated in verse 1 and then again in verse 2. The promise is that you will be blessed. Now, that word blessing is a word that's used all throughout the book of Psalms. Um, it's a word that is used in Psalm 1. You remember John talked about that a couple of weeks ago. He said, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, but who meditates on the word of the Lord. The word blessing is used all throughout the book of Psalms, but I'll tell you that Hebrew word blessing means something far deeper, something far more meaningful and significant than the way that we use that term blessed today. You know, today we use the word blessed. Let's say that you go on um, a really extravagant vacation. Maybe this summer you, you've gone on a wonderful vacation. You kind of want to brag about it. You want everybody to know what a great vacation you went on. So what do you do? You, you post pictures, right, on Instagram or Facebook of this great vacation, but you don't want people to think of you as, as though you're bragging about it, so you put a little hashtag, right? You say, hashtag blessed, right? That's, that's the way to communicate there's some humility because I recognize this is a blessing. We use blessed in that pretty trivial sort of way, but you know, the psalmist, when he says that you will be blessed, that word blessing, it means a deep joy, it means a lightness to your spirit as you go about your life. To be blessed means to have this incredible sense of inner well-being and peace. It's what people are chasing after in the wellness movement or in self-care or in meditation. To be blessed means it is well with my soul. But you notice, who is that blessing for? Who gets to experience that deep sense of inner joy and well-being? Well, David tells us, he says, this blessing is for the forgiven. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. David says the most deeply blessed person is the person who knows that they have been deeply blessed forgiven. After all, when it comes to uh, forgiveness, uh, Tim Keller, the, the pastor and writer, says when it comes to forgiveness, there are essentially three kinds of people in the world. Did you know that? Uh, one type of person, there, there, there are some people who, who feel that they are essentially too bad to be forgiven. Uh, maybe there's some guilt that they carry from some particular thing that maybe they've, they've done in their life. They feel like, you know, I've hurt too many people. I've let too many people down. I've blown it too often. Maybe there's a certain way that they feel like they've, they've hurt their, their family, people close to them, a spouse or children, and they just carry that guilt. Do you know anybody like that? Any of you maybe feel that way? You know, David says it's like, it's like your bones are drying up within you. There's no lightness to your spirit. You're just weighed down by that sense of guilt, shame. There are some people who feel that they are too bad to be forgiven. There are other people 
though, who feel like they are too good to be forgiven. Too good to need to be forgiven. You know, I have, a, I have a friend of mine who shared with me just the other day. He said um, there was a season where he was working for actually a church. And, and in this church, um, he, he was in a position where he was supposed to communicate some of the vision of this church. And he remembers being in a, in a meeting with some of the leaders of the church. And he made this comment. He said, um, you know, we are all broken people who are in need of redemption. And he said they all looked at him kind of funny. And so he tried to explain what he meant. And he said, well, well, well I mean, like, you know, we're, we're, we're all selfish in different ways. And we're all sinful. That's part of our nature. And so we're people who, who need forgiveness. And they looked at him and they said, no, we don't, we don't say that. We don't use that, that kind of, of language here. We think to talk about people being bad and sinful, that just excludes people. It makes them feel badly about themselves. And so we prefer not to really use that language about sin. Now, that was very shocking to my friend. He struggled to really make sense of that, after all, because didn't Jesus say that he had come into the world precisely to save sinners, to seek and save the lost? Why else did Jesus need to go to the cross if we were not people desperately in need of God's forgiveness? But, you know, there are some people, frankly, even religious people, people who might be regularly going to church who feel like they are essentially too good to need to be forgiven. They're doing all these good religious things, doing all these good things for their neighbors so they don't feel like they need to be forgiven. And frankly, in our culture today, increasingly, there are some people who would say, you know what, I don't think I need to be forgiven because I'm not even sure that there's a God to forgive me. You remember the guy I mentioned, if you were here a few weeks ago, the, the lawyer who called me up one day and said to me, he said, you know, when I was in law school, I, I got rid of the idea of God. I stopped believing in God. And he said, I thought that would be very freeing for me because I thought, great, I'm not going to have to deal with any guilt anymore. Right now I can live however I want. It's really up to me to decide what's right and wrong for me. And I'm not going to feel any guilt because I don't have to worry about God and living for him anymore. And yet he said, nevertheless, I feel like there still is this sense of guilt. And I can't shake it. And I know that I've done some wrong things and I've treated some people in some wrong ways. And my girlfriend, she says, you got to just forgive yourself. My therapist says, you got to just forgive yourself. But I can't let that feeling of guilt go. I can't just forgive myself. And, you know, frankly, even people who would say we don't need forgiveness because we don't even believe there's a God to forgive us, nevertheless, can't quite shake the sense that we need to be forgiven. But there are those two types of people, those who feel they are too bad to be forgiven, those who feel like they are too good to need to be forgiven. But then there's a third group of people. The third group of people are very self-aware. They're very honest with themselves because they would say, absolutely, I need to be forgiven. I know I'm a broken person. I know I'm not who I need to be. I need to be forgiven, but I have been. I know I need it, but I also know that I have it. Simultaneously, I know that I've been forgiven. And David says, those are the people who are blessed. Those are the people who have this promised joy and peace, this inner lightness and well-being, because they know they need to be forgiven, and yet they know they have been forgiven. They don't have to cover up anymore. You notice David says, he says, when I kept silent, when I tried to cover up my iniquity, he said, there was this anguish in my soul. And don't you know what it's like to try to project a better version of yourself to others? And how exhausting and draining that can be. When you're constantly covering up, when you're trying to impress, when you're trying to convince other people, when you're trying to convince yourself that you're, you're, you've got it more together than you really do, it's exhausting. Wouldn't it be freeing? Wouldn't it be amazing to think I don't have to cover up anymore? To know I'm forgiven, I'm loved, I'm accepted by the person whose opinion of me matters more than anyone else's in the entire universe. Friends, that's the promise of confession. It's this blessing, this deep joy and inner well-being in your soul. So how do you get it? What's the process? How do you go about confessing in the kind of way where you experience that sort of blessing? 
Well, I want us to notice two things about David's prayer of confession, two things for us to learn about this process of confession. And here's the first. When you confess your sin before God, frankly, before other people as well, if you've wronged somebody else, when you confess your sin, first off, you've got to grieve the sin and not just the consequences from the sin. You've got to grieve the sin, not just the consequences from the sin. Did you notice in verses 8 through 9, after David confesses his sin, he senses that God is speaking to him these words. Verse 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. And then he says, do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Now, I've not spent a lot of time around mules uh, or horses, uh, but I can read commentaries, and they talk about um, what David might be um, referencing here with the the mule and the horse, and and what they explain is the fact that, let's say you're you're riding this mule, and you're trying to maybe farm your land, and you want to keep that mule going in this straight direction. If that mule veers off course, what do you do? You use the bridle. You use the bit. Right? You, you hit the mule or you kick the mule or you pull on, on the bit in its mouth. And the mule, of course, doesn't like that. It's painful. And you see, it's the pain, it's the consequence of veering off course that gets the mule back on course. The mule's not getting back on course because suddenly now it wants to um, please and, 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 and honor its master saying, oh, I want to make sure that I'm doing a really good job in my farming for you. No, the mule doesn't even think about that. The mule has no understanding. The mule only gets back on course because of the threat of the pain. And you see, what God is saying to David here is he's saying, David, I want a relationship with you not like that of a master to its mule. Right? I don't want you to confess your sin just because you're unhappy now with the consequences that have come from it or because you're afraid of the consequences that might come if you don't. He says, I want you to be like verses 8, where where you have this, this intimate personal relationship with me, where you know me, where you want to obey me, where you you follow me, you turn to me, or you come back to me because you miss me, because you miss that intimacy with me, that, that relationship where I have my loving eye upon you, where we relate face to face as friends. See, that's what God is is calling David back to because there's a difference, isn't there, uh, between grieving the consequences of sin versus grieving the sin itself. And by the way, David knew this dynamic from his own life. Some of you, if you know anything about the life of of David, you know there um, were were times when David was this tremendous leader, a great military um, leader, great administrative leader, and he was a very um, deeply devoted leader person to God. He wrote many of the Psalms. But you also might know that David had an incredible moral failure in his life. There was a moment where he looked out and he saw this this beautiful woman bathing and he was attracted to her. And this woman was married to one of his loyal fighters, a guy by the name of Uriah, a guy who had risked his life for David time and again, incredibly loyal friend. And yet David betrayed his trust. He he took Bathsheba, this woman, this other man's wife, and he forced himself upon her. He slept with her. And the consequence was that Bathsheba became pregnant. That was the consequence of David's sin. And you know, there always are consequences for sin. We've said that before. We said that in our Seven Deadly Sins series that often sin is its own punishment. That whether we see those consequences right away or not, eventually there are consequences that come with every sin because when we set ourselves against the moral fabric of God's universe, we would expect that sin, it's a little bit like a boomerang. It ends up coming back upon us. That was the case for David. And you've got to assume, right, when David found out that Bathsheba was pregnant, don't you think he grieved the consequence of the sin? That he thought to himself, oh gosh, what have I done Oh, man, I should not have done that. I mean, what if Uriah finds out? 
What if the other fighting men find out? What if they turn on me? What if they cease to be loyal to me? What will my family think of me? What will the kingdom think of me? What if I were to lose my whole kingdom over this? You've got to know that when David found out the consequence, he grieved the consequence of the sin. But in that moment, David did not yet grieve the sin itself. And he didn't change, at least not right away. You know, somebody shared with me recently about a coworker. So he had this coworker who was treating uh, fellow coworkers, the people he supervised, pretty badly. He, he was speaking to them in really unkind ways, and eventually it got so bad that the supervisor had to, to intervene and, and meet with him, put him on a performance plan, said, if you don't change the way that you treat people, you're going to be fired. And apparently this guy was really moved and he, he, he was really apologetic and he shared about things going on in his life and he said, I'm just so sorry, I won't uh, do it, I will change. And, and, and a couple of months went by and he was back to the same behavior, back to treating people in the same way. Why is it sometimes, you see this in relationships sometimes, why is it that somebody can seem so apologetic, they seem so genuinely sorry, but nothing changes? It's often because they're grieving the consequences of the sin. They're afraid of what might happen to them because of the sin, but they're not actually grieving the sin itself. You see, David, he figured out, I think I can cover this up. When he realized he could cover it up, when he thought, I can get away with it, he actually killed off Bathsheba's husband to get away with it. When he thought, I can get away with this, then suddenly he was thinking, you know what, I think I'm fine. And it was only later. It was only later that he actually came to grieve the sin itself. Psalm 51 is another prayer of confession. Maybe you've read that before. There David says, God, I realize I have sinned against you. That I have hurt your heart, God, through my actions. I've sinned against you. Here in Psalm 32, David says, I, I, I confess to you and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Doesn't that seem a little redundant? the guilt of my sin. But you see, what he's getting at is he's saying, you forgave the sinness of my sin. I came to see the guilt of my sin. I came to see how my sin had actually hurt your heart, and that's what you've forgiven. Now, practically, what does it look like not just to confess or grieve the consequences of sin, but to actually grieve the sinness of sin? the guilt of the sin itself. Let me give you an example um, as it relates to other people and then as it relates to God. As it relates to other people, imagine this with me, that maybe you're married and your spouse says to you as you're sitting on the couch, hey, um, would you be willing to get up and, and to do this particular thing that I need help doing? And, and imagine that your response is to say, well, I'm tired. And, you know, I've done all these other things. Why don't you do it? Now, I know that's very hard for you to imagine. You can't um, probably even begin to think that somebody could respond in such a selfish way. Um, but um, let's say that's your response. Now, let's say the other spouse comes back and says, well, hang on a second. I've done all these other things. You're forgetting, you know, I've been, I've been serving in all of these ways, and these are the ways that I've been uh, contributing to our family. And now you're in an argument. Right now you're going back and forth, arguing over who is doing more to contribute to the various different needs of the family. And eventually, let's say that you're in that argument and you think to yourself, this isn't fun. Right? I don't, I don't want to be arguing. It's not enjoyable to be in this place of conflict. And so you say, you know what? I don't like that. Let's just try to, to move past it. And you say to your spouse, can we just put this behind us? Can, can we just forget about this? Can we just move forward and have a good time together for the rest of of the evening. Anybody ever responded that way before? Well, can I tell you what that is? That's actually just grieving the consequence of the sin, uh, not actually grieving or confessing the sin itself. You're saying, I'm uncomfortable being in this place of conflict. I don't like being in a place of conflict, so how do I get out of that uncomfortable situation? But what it would look like to actually grieve the sin itself I'm sorry for, for, for being selfish. I'm sorry for, 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 for responding out of that selfishness. I'm sorry for what I said. I'm sorry for not being willing to help. I was only looking at it from my perspective rather than seeing things from your perspective as well. I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? Do you see the difference? 
That's actually grieving how your sin maybe has hurt the other person, but not just the uncomfortable circumstances that have come from it. So how, how does that relate to God? Well, let me give you another example. So let's say that you are uh, feeling very bitter. You're bitter because somebody has done something that upsets you, that irritates you. You've been holding on to that bitterness. You know that God wants you to forgive them, but you don't want to forgive them. You want to hold on to that bitterness. You're harboring that bitterness, but then eventually you realize, you know, it's not fun to be bitter. I don't like always being bitter. And so you say to God, God, help me not to be bitter. Help me to forgive. Again, that's grieving the consequences, but not the sin. To grieve the sin would be to understand and to think about and confess, how has my refusing to forgive this person actually hurt the heart of God? And so to grieve the sin would be to say to God, God, I can't imagine what it must be like to create someone and then to go to such incredible lengths to forgive them, that you would send your son to die on a cross for their sin and yet for them to then choose to refuse to forgive a much smaller uh, offense than you have already forgiven to them. God, I can't imagine what that must be like. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry for grieving your heart in that way. Would you help me to forgive this person the way you've already forgiven me? Do you see the difference? See, David, he, he grieves, he confesses the sin itself, not just its consequences. And then secondly, Secondly, if you want to experience the blessing of, 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 of what's promised to us in this psalm, you have to take full responsibility for the sin without excuses. To take full responsibility. Now, that's, that's easier said than done, isn't it? Anybody ever seen one of those like public apology moments where a celebrity or an athlete or a politician maybe has, has, has had an outburst of anger, they've, they've acted inappropriately, they've said or done something offensive, and now they have to call a press conference, and they've got to give a public apology. You know, God forbid we ever find ourselves in that sort of situation. How hard would that be? But, but if you look at those public apology moments, pay careful attention, because you'll notice um, that often there are two words that are missing. Two words that are often not spoken in those moments. You might hear somebody share about how their emotions got the better of them. Maybe they would say, you know, that's not who I am. Don't judge me by that. They might say, you know, we all are human. We all make mistakes or I've been under a lot of stress. Share the circumstances they've been facing. But there are often two words that are missing. Do you know those two words? I'm sorry. I was wrong. I messed up. Isn't it amazing how difficult it can be to speak those two words? And frankly, not just for them. I mean, for me, ask my, my wife, Brandy. Sometimes it's hard for me just to simply say, I'm sorry. If any of you are fans of the TV show, The Office, you might remember the, uh, the scene where the, the company has um, they, they've had this kind of scandalous mistake that they've made, and as a result, they're having to respond to a lot of complaints from the customers, and there's this one character, Angela, she's fairly self-righteous, and she's having to answer these phone calls, and she says to one of the customers, she says, um, listen, I've already told you that the official stance of the company is apologetic, so what do you want from me? <laughs> and the two words she will not bring herself to simply say are, I'm sorry can be hard words to say. And even when we say them, we struggle not to attach a third word to them. You know that word? I'm sorry, but. I'm sorry, but I was really tired. I'm sorry, but I was really stressed, meaning, right, you can't really hold me responsible for how I've acted because I was tired or stressed. Or I'm sorry, but you know I'm still a pretty great person. I'm sorry, but... You know, everybody makes mistakes. I'm sorry, but you know I'm only human, meaning downplaying the significance of what I've, I've done, or maybe I'm sorry, but if you hadn't said what you said, or I'm sorry, but if you hadn't done what you had done, right now you're blame shifting instead of truly apologizing. And often even in our confessing, we're still covering. We're still downplaying, we're still excusing, we're still trying to justify ourselves. 
And yet, what does David say in verse 5? He says, I did not cover up my iniquity. I acknowledged my sin to you. Without excuses. And listen, in human relationships, I know it often takes two people to tango. Right? Usually, if there's a conflict, both people are at fault in some way. But what it means to confess by taking responsibility means, let's say it's 20% your fault, 80% their fault. You own the 20% that's your fault, and you shut up about the 80%. You don't talk to the person about their fault. You confess your fault and take responsibility in that. That's the same thing with God. Right? When we come before God, if we want to experience this, this blessing, we come before him and we say, God, I don't feel that you owe me your forgiveness. Right? God, you don't owe me anything. All that you owe me is your, your displeasure. All that you owe me is your justice. God, I'm not entitled to be forgiven. I'm not entitled to be loved by you. You know, there's a place in the book of Romans where it says that on the day of judgment, Every mouth will be stopped, meaning nobody will be able to look at God and say, God, you have done me wrong. You've treated me unfairly. What it means to take responsibility before God is to say, God, you don't owe me anything but your judgment, and I'm simply asking for your mercy that I do not deserve. You see, we, we, we grieve the sin, not just its consequences, we take full responsibility without excuses. Now, that's hard, isn't it? It's very hard. When we said before, often we're covering up even as we're trying to confess our sin. And so, therefore, where do we get the power to be able to do this? Let's end with this. Where do we get the power to confess in the way that we often resist so that we can experience that forgiveness and blessing that we deeply need? And I want to suggest that the answer is found in verse 7. There David speaks these words, even as he's been confessing his sin, he says, God, you are my hiding place. You are my hiding place. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. David knows that even in the midst of his sin, he can hide himself in God, that he is safe in God. Now, isn't that a little bit surprising? I don't know about you, but often for me, when I'm honest about my sin, I don't feel like I can hide in God. I feel like I want to hide from God. And yet here David says, no, I can hide in God. How can you hide from God by hiding in God? And, you know, Paul tells us the answer in Romans chapter 4. Paul actually quotes from this psalm, Psalm 32. In Romans chapter 4, and there what Paul tells us is he said, David understands that the way that God covers our sin, you know, verse 1 says, blessed are the ones whose sins are covered. The way God covers our sins is not through a cover up. It's not a divine cover up. God's not just sort of pretending that our sin is not there. No, rather the way that God covers our sin is by reaccounting our sin. By counting our sin, not to us, but to someone else. By transferring our sin to someone else. You know, David says, blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against him. And you see, what Paul says in Romans 4 is that God has counted our sin, not against us. He's counted it against Jesus. That on the cross, Jesus was not covered. He was naked. He was exposed as he bore all of the judgment of God for your sin and for mine. All of our sin was counted to Jesus, not to us. But then Paul goes a step further. This is verse 6 of Romans 4. He says, David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Meaning what? Not just is our sin counted to Jesus, but his righteousness is credited to us. It's counted to us. We are covered in the righteousness of Jesus. And what that means, friends, if you believe that, is that you're safe. It means that you can hide from God in God. 
means that you're safe in the righteousness of Jesus. You are covered from the judgment of God, which has already fallen on Jesus in your place. And listen, if you know that that's true, then for you, confession doesn't have to be something to fear. You don't have to approach confession like you're being you know, dragged downtown to a police station to give a, a confession. Confession can actually be something that you look forward to, something that you relish, because it's a way for you to be reminded again of your relationship with this God, to be restored to that intimacy with this God, to be reminded that your relationship with him is on the basis of his grace on the basis of Jesus' record, not yours. Confession becomes this way for you to open the vents of your heart every day to experience what it is to be loved and accepted on the basis of God's grace and to know that you are safe in Jesus. David says, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against him. Let's pray as we come to the Lord's table this morning. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to this table this morning, we do not keep silent. We do not try to cover up our sin from you. We recognize that you see everything you see to the very depths of our hearts. Lord, we don't pretend that we are too good to need your forgiveness. We recognize and acknowledge that you do not owe us your mercy. And yet we thank you that through your son, Jesus, you have not counted our sin against us, You've counted it to him so that you in turn might credit us with his righteousness. I pray that as we come to this table this morning, we would believe that and we would experience the blessing of knowing that our sins have been forgiven. And God, I pray that this would be something that we would not resist or fear or run from, but that this practice of confession that David shows us of of grieving our sin and openly acknowledging it before you. I pray that this would be a practice that, that we would be willing to embrace as a way to regularly experience your undeserved grace and love for us. I pray it would be a practice that we would be freed up to to embrace in our relationships with others as well. That we wouldn't have to be as defensive, that we wouldn't have to be as afraid of criticism, that we would be able to admit when we get things wrong because we know that we are righteous, not in ourselves, but in Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Friends, on the